Hi everyone, I'm back home again. I am back from a couple of weeks in Hawaii, which was fun, but if I'm honest, I kind of came away feeling a little bit like Hawaii was a really good advertisement for Australia. Uh, <laughs> there were many reasons for that. In fact, I'll start with the, with the really, really epically good stuff. Like the most awesome stuff we saw in Hawaii, which I've never been able to see anywhere else, was uh, volcanoes. Volcanoes were epic. We definitely don't have those here, at least not bubbling lava and stuff. Uh, so we actually took a chopper ride through the uh, through the Big Island, uh, over the volcanoes, saw a bunch of stuff bubbling and steam and all that kind of stuff, which was cool. Through the mountains, like Jurassic Park style, big waterfalls and everything. And that was just out of this world. That was absolutely insane. Uh, by far the best thing that we, we did on that trip. I think the things that that maybe I just had a different expectation around with things like beaches. Uh, we have epically good beaches here. I can go about 700 meters that way and they're massive, wide, white, sandy beaches with nice water and breaking waves that the kids can play in. Uh, and we just found that pretty much everywhere we went in Hawaii was, was like uh, lava, which was like the cold lava, which was cool, but it's just like black rock. And when you did get to a beach, it's not quite our definition of a beach. It's like coarse grainy sand and coral and stuff like that. And the snorkeling was just, it's, it's just not quite the same as here. Uh, particularly here, if you go much further north and you go to the Great Barrier Reef. And I, I think that's sort of the feeling we had coming away from it. It's like, look, uh, there is so much here on our doorstep, which is, which is not just equivalent, but significantly better than what we saw. And... I know some people went, well, you should have gone here and should have gone there. We went to a lot of different places on a lot of local advice as well. Uh, and maybe there are better places we could have seen, but come to Australia. <laughs> Australia is just awesome. Plus the things you can't argue with, we've got epic coffee and epic food and a whole bunch of other really neat things here, including kangaroos and other stuff that will bite you when you're not looking. That's an upside for some people. It's an exciting time. Okay, so moving on. I am back. Uh, I was actually in Melbourne just uh, just yesterday and the day before, so I think I had about three and a half days at home before I headed off again. So I went down for a conference there called CRN Pipeline. It's a it's a partner conference run by or a pipeline. What was the right word? Channel Channel Conference. Uh, so for organisations sort of reselling other people's things into uh, into local companies, and they wanted me to do a talk on the cybers. So we spoke about cybers which went really well, did that, did a boardroom session with a bunch of people, jumped on the plane, came home again. And I, I was just checking my, my stats yesterday because I'm trying to reduce my travel. But apparently I have been away 52 of the first 108 days in this year, which is, which is not doing particularly well stat-wise. It was about 48% of the year away. So what I'm actually doing uh, at this stage is I'm saying no to everything in the second half of the year that is not like absolutely out of this world awesome. Uh, so I, I will be back in Europe in June. I just booked those flights this week. So I'll be in London for some events and back at NDC Oslo and that sort of thing. But the second half of this year, I just don't particularly want to go anywhere else. Except for the snow. I think I'm going to go to the snow for a couple of weeks and just try and like get away from the you know, the international travel stuff. Uh, because I, honestly, it's just, it just has been too much. And there's, there's no one reason or catalyst. I'm not getting pressure from my wife. No one's sick or anything like that. It's just like, look, I'm away a lot. And I just really like being home. So we'll see how that goes. That's the plan. I'm sure there'll still be things, but I hope they're things which are, things like the, uh, the congressional testimony last year. I never expected to go over for that, but that is one of those things that's like, wow, once in a lifetime are amazing things. I'll still do that kind of stuff. But the sort of general run of the run of the mill conferences, I just need a little bit of a break from from at least, at least the international stuff. All right, other things. Um, these videos and the lighting and everything. I finally ordered lighting, and I know I spoke several weeks ago when we had a uh, uncharacteristically cloudy day here, and the light was just all over the place. I said, look, I got to bite the bullet, get the lights, do these things right. So I bought a couple of lights. I'll give you all the details once they arrive. A couple of big lights that will go over there and then I'll sort of turn this thing around so I'm not relying on the natural light. Got a little backlight too. Uh, I'm sure that I won't know how to use them near as well as what a lot of very sort of smart video people will, but it will give me something to start with and hopefully make these videos look a little bit cleaner. Uh, I've got to be conscious when I'm traveling of things like the audio as well. So I know the video I did last week in Honolulu, the audio 
Frankly, it was absolutely shit, and I should have realized there was so much background noise sitting outside. I try to sort of show environments when I travel to different places, but that, that sound quality was unacceptable, and I'm sorry, I gotta work on that. Uh, at least being back home, I've got the good mic, just for those of you who might be interested and can see the video. This is what I use for all of my plural site recording. This is an electro voice mic, and it does a fantastic job, and sits on that arm, as you would have seen. All right, so that stuff is awesome. What else we got here on the list for today? Uh, ah, whilst I'm talking about busyness and lots of things to do, <laughs> some, of you, some of you may have picked this up. Uh, I'm, I'm getting way more emails and tweets and things than what I can possibly handle. And I have spoken about this before. And on my contact page, I do sort of say, here's what I'll respond to, may not respond to, definitely won't respond to. Uh, that balance is changing a little bit as exposure changes and I get more communication. So if, uh, if you're not getting a reply on an email and it's the sort of email that's maybe asking for advice uh, or offering advice or, or something which may be sort of a non-essential thing for me to reply to, uh, that's probably why. Uh, and for everyone who sort of says, oh, you should have like canned templates and you just spit those back out at people. I have tried some of this. As soon as you do reply and you begin an engagement, there's more time that goes with the reply that then comes back, you know, I understand, thank you. It's just creating more and more and more workload. So I gotta kind of chop more, uh, I guess, well, from the bottom in terms of what I respond to. Uh, so there's that. Now, moving on to something that some of you might find a little bit more interesting. I got a new thing this week. And in fact, I got this because Scott Helm had one of these in Hawaii. Now, if your listener's not looking at the video, I'm holding a black case. And in this black case, if we figure out how to open this guy up correctly, is a DJI Osmo Mobile 2 gimbal. Looks like this. Now, this is actually really, really neat. And I've seen people use these before. This is not a selfie stick, by the way. I'm not succumbing to a selfie stick. It's not designed to do selfies. What this is designed to do is hold your mobile device in a really, really super steady way. And it's, it's actually kind of freaky when you first use it because it's got little motors in here, which means that even as you sort of, you know, jiggle around because you're walking, or I did one on the boat the other day as well with the sea going all over the place, it holds it steady and it just gives these like epically clear videos. So uh, I'll, I'll link to some of the tweets I posted with these, uh, with videos of what I took the other day uh, when I do this blog post with the, with the video. And you'll see, like it's, it's just insanely good. It's really smooth. It actually feels like video footage from a drone, like a, a gimbal equipped drone, because it's just kind of flying along, even though it's at ground level. So that's a new piece of tech, which I'm actually pretty stoked about. They're not very expensive as well. Uh, in Australia, that one cost about $190 Oz. In USD, it's gonna be 150 or less. So you'll probably pick them up quite cheap in other parts of the world. So that's really, really cool. Very happy with that. Okay, so uh, moving on to other things. Moving on to blog posts. Now, I actually got several posts out today. I have a massive backlog of blog posts, either partly written or sitting here in my head that I really, really want to get out. This, You know, so sometimes, I don't know if you know this, if you blog or not, but you just get this itch of things that you want to write. And I've got a lot of itches at the moment, which I'd really, really like to get completed. Uh, and look, I mean, that's part of the travel thing as well. You know, I want to be able to stay home and do more stuff, to write more stuff, and not just always be on airplanes. Now, several things here. I'm gonna start here. Social media thread hijacking is nothing more than targeted spam. Now, I touched on this in my update last week, and I mentioned that only an hour or so before I did the update, <laughs> there was an account, and I'm just looking at the tweets now just to see where it's been going, an account called uh, Nodestack, which is uh, allegedly in the UK, but there's some fishy stuff about whether they are or not, which was effectively thread hijacking. So what they're doing is uh, they're clearly having uh, some Twitter searches there looking for mentions of hosting providers. Uh, things like HostGator is the one that they seem to keep chiming in on wait till someone mentions HostGator and then jump in and usually mentions HostGator in a derogatory fashion. Hey, uh, my HostGator was down. I wasn't happy with HostGator, something negative HostGator. And then they jump in and what they're saying here 
is in this particular case, if you're still looking, by the way, spell your correctly, there's an apostrophe in the eagle eyes. If you're still looking for a new host, we would love you as a client. We are 100% independent and have far better service than the big brands. I can offer you a free month if you would like to compare service, nodestack.net. Now, I have no issue with people advertising and we have constructs to advertise. They're called promoted tweets and you give Twitter a little bit of money and then they promote it. You could advertise on Facebook. You can buy AdWords on Google. Like there are all sorts of ways of promoting what you do if you need to promote it. This is just not a good way of doing that because this is jumping into a conversation that other people are having and saying, hey, why don't you buy our stuff? And in many cases here, it was just bizarrely out of context as well. So there'd be people discussing ghosts. Someone says, hey, I just set up ghost, uh, which I use for my blog as well, by the way. Someone else says, okay, that'd be great, but I'd have to migrate all my stuff. Then these guys jump in and go, just put it all in our thing with WordPress. And it's just continually butting into conversations. Now, I don't want to just single them out because I've got a lot of examples here of other organizations having done this over time as well. As an example here where someone mentions uh, he's getting DocuSign phishing emails to an address that isn't in Have I Been Pwned, CC Troy Hunt. And then this company called Sign Now, which does electronic signatures, obviously a DocuSign competitor, says, check out signnow.com, the secure e-sign solution by Barracuda Networks. This is not what the guy was after. The guy was complaining about getting spam, phishing spam, related to an e-signature platform. And then another e-signature platform comes along and spams him and says, why don't you try our platform instead? <laughs> like this, it's just indiscriminate blasting of messages. And speaking of blasting, I've got an example in here of Slick VPN. Now this is from 18 months ago and they don't seem to be doing this anymore, so good on them for that. And there's a screen cap here, just tweet after tweet after tweet. Check us out. We're $10 a month and offer an unconditional refund for the first 30 days, thanks. Same hour, check us out. We're $10 a month and on and on and on and on. And these accounts just blast messages. Uh, another one as well, and, and a lot of this again is indiscriminate because it's, it's missing the context of what people are talking about and just saying, hey, buy our things. Guardian Digital, prevent phishing attacks with comprehensive cloud-based email security that provides end-to-end -end control of your email. This is in response to someone who is a security researcher talking about identifying phishing emails targeting American Express customers. <laughs> this just doesn't make sense. Now, here's where it gets interesting though, because most of the, in fact, let's take a step back. The main reason for me writing this, and this was another one that had been on the drawing board for a while, and eventually these guys popped up last week and made asses of themselves, and that was the catalyst. This is a situation where there are many different companies doing it, and I wanted to have something where when it happens again, I go, hey, here is the blog post that explains why this is a bad thing. Because what eventually happened here is I replied to these guys originally, the NoteSec ones, and said, look, this was just a reply directly to them. It wasn't a quote tweet or something. So this is called thread hijacking. It's frowned upon. You really want to reconsider this. And from there, I just kept giving them more rope as they defended their position. Oh, it's just business, it's not personal. It sounded very mob-like. They literally said it's not personal, it's just business. Um, and they kept sort of taking more and more and more of this rope, justifying the position and arguing uh, to the point where I said, okay, look, this is the way you view it. Let, let's ask everyone, you know, let's ask the masses. And uh, I, I did then send a quote tweet and said to everyone, look, how do you feel about this? And it would have been about 80% plus of people said, this is really crap, like don't do this. I'm literally going to avoid you, mark you a spam, block you if you do this. And then there are a small percentage of people that said, look, this is okay. Some of them actually then changed their mind later on after they saw the way this account behaved. So anyway, there's that. What I expected after tweeting them was what I often see from other accounts after raising the same issues. So for example, uh, there's one here where someone replies to, let's see, <laughs> that someone was me by the look of it. So Sign Now was, uh, was trying to sort of push their, their thing. These are the, the signature guys. Uh, now, what happened here? I quote tweeted them. This was back in September last year. 
and said, uh, I recently tried to explain to someone how threat hijacking to push a company's product is perceived. How do you feel about this behavior? Now, incidentally, I remember this, this, uh, th this thing that which was the precursor to this, which was there was a company operating in a similar space to Have I Been Pwned. And every time someone mentioned Have I Been Pwned, these guys would jump in and go, hey, Have I Been Pwned doesn't do this or that or whatever, come and try our things, which of course was a loss leader to then trying to extract money from the person. And I actually contacted the company privately uh, via DM and said, look, this is, this is not on. Like, this is just really shitty behavior. Yeah, people are going to have a negative perception of you. I don't like seeing it on my feed as well because I'm seeing the Have I Been Pwned mentioned. You really want to cut this out. Uh, and they did. To their credit, they cut it out. I still think it was a shitty thing to do and very, very poor judgment, but they cut it out. So then this sign now one popped up. Uh, now they, after seeing me quote, quote their tweet and people sort of discussing it, said, uh, hey, you guys are right. That is spammy. We're sorry about that. Thanks for pointing it out and we'll tighten things up. Good on you guys. Like This is the right way to respond to criticism. And I think it was fair criticism, evidently. But that's the right way to respond. Uh, and I've got multiple examples in this blog post of organizations then coming back and saying, you know what, you're right, this does, actually doesn't look good, we shouldn't do this. So getting back to these node stack guys, <laughs> as the Twitters did start to chime in on the discussion, people raised all sorts of screwy things about the way they were operating. Uh, fake trust pilot rating, uh, missing business registration data. Apparently if you're a UK business, you've got to have business or, or information about the business on the site. What possibly explains that is I couldn't find any reference of these guys on LinkedIn except for someone in Portugal and someone in Bangladesh. So maybe that's not a UK business. Uh, cohabitation with spam sites. Someone found a bunch of spam sites on the same IP. A bad SSL labs rating. It, I mean, that, that sort of alone is not a big thing. Uh, that was then the one thing that they replied to and tried to justify uh, basically by just simply not understanding what perfect forward secrecy is. Uh, loads and loads of open ports, failing F grade on securityheaders.io, which is Scott Helms' service. So they just had no HSTS, no CSP, no CAA, like none, none of the good things which go into a, a good security posture. And that was only in response to them claiming to have watertight security, which was a little bit tone deaf given we'd just done the T-Mobile Austria thing where they got absolutely smashed out of the park for saying similar things. But anyway, here we are. So um, so that was interesting and I, I actually found even like the day after I published it, someone saw another case of this thread hijacking uh, and then used this blog post as an example to them and said, here, here guys, this is why you shouldn't do this. So look, frankly, this was much more about the, the pattern and the practice and something I hope is used on an ongoing basis than what it was about NodeStack. Uh, I honestly couldn't care less about what those guys do. It's easy for me to mute them. Um, but hopefully, uh, maybe now when other people Google node stack or thread hijacking, they'll find this blog post. Anywho, so that's those guys. Now, on to more constructive things. Pluralsight. So I launched a new Pluralsight course this week. In fact, this was a Pluralsight course that I recorded with Lars Clint down in Sydney about two months ago. And it's a play-by-play. -play. So this is where Lars and I are like sitting here, looking at the camera, talking to each other, and also doing screencasts, so recording what's happening on the machine. And this is about modern web security patterns. And what I wanted to do with this this play-by-play -play is to sort of take a bunch of the either emerging standards or, or standards which are quite new that many people are not familiar with in terms of security things that you should do when you're building websites. And by pure coincidence, earlier this week, I had a phone call with a large bank talking about security things. And I found it really interesting. This was security people at the bank. Found it really interesting to, to hear some of the questions and, and get a sense of, of where the level of understanding was on some of these technologies. And the, the, the penny that dropped, and I, I kind of knew this when we recorded the course, but it just hit home again this week, is that there's a lot of new stuff that can be confusing or that people don't necessarily understand. So, you know, for example, and I'll just have a look through some of the, the content we actually have in this course, things like, um, when I was talking to the bank, and this is in the course as well, we're talking about HPKP, so HTTP public key pinning. So this was the ability to say, let's take the public key of the TLS cert, pin it in a response header, or rather send it in a response header to the browser, the browser pins it, 
if you then go to this site later on within a predefined max age period and you get a different cert, the connection is rejected because it could have been a rogue cert issued by someone else who was able to actually issue a legitimate but rogue cert. Rogue simply being not the one that's meant to be on the site, but someone's compromised a CA DigiNodar style, for example. Now, HPKP is getting deprecated by Chrome because frankly it did more harm than good. And now we've got things like CAA, so Certificate Authority Authorization, where at the DNS level, you can say, hey, for say troyhunt.com, and you can see this on troyhunt.com if you like, go and do a DNS query for it. On troyhunt.com, uh, it can only have certificates issued by say, let's encrypt, for argument's sake. I think I've got Komodo in there as well because Cloudflare issues Komodo certs. But if you're not one of those two providers, and then some other CA somewhere is requested to issue a cert, they'll reject it because all CAs have to actually look at CAA records on DNS. So we've got things like that which replace the old things, but many people have never heard of CAA before. Look up CAA, it's actually absolutely awesome. In fact, watch the course, <laughs> CAA's in there. So there's that, there's a bunch of stuff around CSPs as well and some of the nuances of CSPs. So things like we can use upgrade insecure requests in content security policy such that if you have an HTTPS page but something in there is HTTP, then that request for that will get upgraded to HTTPS and you won't get warnings in the browser or content blocked if it's active. So images will still load, but you'll get a warning in the browser. Script is active, get blocked. Now, part of the discussion I was having earlier this week as well was interesting because they said, well, we're, we've got HSTS, so we'll be right. Well, HSTS is great, but HSTS only applies to the domain at which it's set. So Have I Been Pwned has got HSTS with preload, you cannot possibly make an insecure request to haveibeenpwned.com, but if I put some insecure references in the page of haveibeenpwned.com, then HSTS doesn't help with that if they're from different domains. So like I'm embedding stuff, say, from Discuss. Discuss had, in, well, I don't put Discuss on Have I Been Pwned, but hypothetically, if I had Discuss on Have I Been Pwned, and I might embed it securely, but then somewhere down the pipeline of requests that they then make, they made an insecure request. HSTS doesn't fix that, but CSP with upgrade insecure request does. Even talking about it starts to sound confusing. So, so there's a heap of stuff like that, which is in the course. And the play-by-plays are intentionally high level, easy to consume. You can watch it on the train and not have to think too much or watch it over lunch or something like that. Uh, I'm really happy we've done that course. Uh, go and check that one out if some of these concepts uh, are not familiar or if you're saying, as was the case with the bank, look, we're about to stand up a new asset, we've got to think about where do we start? You know, What are all the things that we should do security-wise beyond all the fundamental XSS SQL injection kind of stuff? So that's cool. That is out. That's live. You guys can go and watch that now. Now, one more thing, and I did this one just before... I started recording this. Uh, I actually wrote this while I was away, but I wanted to get it out today uh, just so that I leave a bit of space next week for other things. Is enumerating resources on a website hacking? Let's talk about the context of this. I'm not even sure what the feedback from the masses is yet because I literally went publish and then came straight here. There was a case that popped up in Canada during this week where, and I, I'm going to Put this carefully because I, I suspect there may be more to the story. So we're going to do a little bit of allegedly here. Where allegedly a 19 year old guy in Canada accessed a whole bunch of documents he wasn't meant to access on a freedom of information website. And what it sounds like is that he has found a document legitimately, ethically, by following links, whatever it may be. And he said, look, I would like to take a copy of all of these documents. And the, the premise that's shared here is that apparently this guy just likes downloading lots of stuff from the internet. Yeah, fair enough. So I'm going to take a copy of a whole bunch of these documents. And by looking at the URL, I can see that all I have to do is change an identifier in that URL and I get another document. Now, obviously, this document is available publicly because when I change that URL, it downloaded. So he's, he's automated the process, saved a whole bunch of documents offline, Job done, everyone's happy, except that a bunch of those documents weren't meant to be public. Now, the way this has been presented, and at face value, allegedly, this sounds like this is the case. It sounds like the guy pulled a bunch of these documents with no malicious intent whatsoever. He just wanted to have an offline copy. Maybe he just wanted to be able to search through them easier or something like that. And then the cops turned up. 
<laughs> which is never a good thing. And uh, allegedly the cops turned up because a whole bunch of those documents weren't meant to be public. Now, this is where we, we sort of have two different paths we can go down. The one in defense of what he's done and the one which says enumerating through URLs uh, is actually hacking or a bad thing or in breach of CFAA if you're in the US, etc. So let, let's talk about both routes. Now, the, the, the defensive route for this guy is that the way the web works, if a, if a resource is publicly accessible so you can hit a URL and download it, then it's publicly accessible. It's like that there, there is no authorization requirement. You're not challenged. You don't have to provide credentials. You're not deliberately circumventing an access control. You're just hitting a URL. And, and that is a very, very valid argument. In this case, th this is what it sounds like the guy did. You know, it's literally just hit URLs, download information, which is public. The counter argument is that Sometimes organizations cock up their security. I know, stunning. In this case, that sounds like what's happened. They did not put an access control on something that was meant to have an access control. I personally think a lot of the discussion here centers around the intent of the guy and whether he knowingly circumvented a control. Now, and I know I just said there was no control as well, but I also said there are cases where we know there should be control. So, so let's actually drill down on that a little bit. We'll go off on a tangent. This whole premise of insecure direct object references is important. Now, insecure direct object references were in the OWASP top 10 in 2013. They were their own thing. So it is a known published risk slash vulnerability. It's since been rolled into, I think, lack of access controls, broken access controls. Uh, so they've merged it. But the whole premise of you can have a URL with an identifier in it and it points to some resource on the machine, on the server. And if you modify the URL, it points to another resource and you get to pull that. And then there is a lack of access controls over the resource. Okay, so in a, in a case like you see a number in a URL and you plus one to it and you get someone else's record, that would be an insecure direct object reference. Now, it's a published vulnerability, we know that. We have multiple precedents within the industry of people exploiting insecure direct object references, pulling large amounts of data. Bird just flew into my window. He's all right. <laughs> okay, so people exploiting insecure indirect object references, pulling large amounts of data uh, pertaining to other people. And there's two examples I gave in here. One was a local Aussie bloke called Patrick Webster in 2011. He, on, uh, on the First Date Superannuation website, so superannuation in Australia is a little bit like 401k in the US, he looked at the URL, uh, saw numbers, and went, oh, I wonder what would happen if I added one, saw someone else's financial statement. He then did that, just to make sure it wasn't an accident, another uh, 770,000 times. So he pulled 770,000 records of other people. Now, this is mechanically the same thing insofar as you manipulate a parameter in the URL, you get another resource from the server. It wasn't a document per se, but it was a web page listing other people's financial info. When he did that the first time, it would have been manual. He would have gone, oh, look at that up there in the URL. That's interesting. There's a, there's a number and I change it. Oh, look, uh, now suddenly I've got Jimbo's superannuation. When you do that the first time, you know there's a problem because you know you're not meant to see Jimbo's superannuation info. And that is the point where you've got to stop and report this thing. There is absolutely no good reason to do it another 770,000 times. It's another example in here, a guy called Andrew Orenheimer, also known as Weave. If you Google him, get a stiff drink first because there's all sorts of weird shit that happens with this guy. However, that aside, he found a vulnerability in at and that allowed him to pull, I think it was 114,000 iPad owners information. This goes back to 2010 now, so quite some time ago. Same sort of deal. He saw there was, I think in this case it was an API call, he could modify a number, pull back another record. Both these guys knew what they were doing. They both operate in the security space, they were both very clearly faced with someone else's data. So in many ways it's very different to the Canadian bloke. But in other ways it's very similar because it is still enumerating through resources and much of the defense I saw for the Canadian bloke was that if it is publicly facing its free game. I don't agree with this premise. So just to be really clear, 
based on everything that we can see with the Canadian bloke, he's absolutely been thrown under the bus very unfairly and he should get off. And those responsible for throwing him under that bus should go and have a good hard look at themselves in the mirror, allegedly. <laughs> so let's be clear about that. But this whole premise of just because it's publicly facing its free game and you can do whatever you want with it just simply doesn't fly. Both Patrick and Weave ended up getting picked up by the cops. Weave got charged. And in fact, he got sentenced as well and ended up going to, I think from memory, he went to jail for a while and then got off on something else. Either way, it was not a fun time for him. And if you're in that position where you're looking at a URL and you're saying, hey, I can pull other data just by manipulating it, must be public, therefore it's free game, don't do that because you don't want to be picked up by the cops. You don't want to have this on your record. Whether you think it's fair game or not, that is not an experience you want to have. So, in summary here, I hope the Canadian bloke gets off because it sounds like he's quite innocent. There is a little bit of a, a question in my mind as to whether there is more to it than this because the way it's presented does sound very sensational. You know, innocent kid, kid, 19 year old, pulls some data down from the internet, cops turn up, take his things away, gets charged. That doesn't sound like it gels. I will be very happy if he gets off. I won't be happy, but I'll be understanding if there was more to it and it was malicious and then he got charged based on that because when we go and we look at those other examples with the Weave stuff and the Patrick Webster stuff, that's now well and truly in the space where you're going to get yourself into trouble. So that's my views on enumeration and parameter tampering and insecure direct object references. Uh, more so, actually, <laughs> let's be really clear about this. If you're building systems, this is a major mistake. Like, don't do this. <laughs> you should have proper access controls on your things. And if you don't have access controls on your things, you kind of do have to expect that people are going to access them in ways that you would not otherwise intend them to do. So be, let's wrap it up on that. This is very clearly the fault of the organization. And then there's just a question if there's any blame to apportion for people who then take advantage of that fault. Move on. <laughs> so last thing. Our blog sponsorship this week is Terbium Labs. Uh, in fact, this week is RSA week, isn't it? So I think they wanted to be on there during the week of RSA, which of course is a big event over in San Francisco. I went to last year. We've had the discussion about too much travel this year, which is why I'm not there now. But Terbium Labs is there. They've got their match light product, which they, uh, they're plugging. I'm sure that they've got to stand there like many of the other vendors at RSA. It is uh, quite the spectacle if you get a chance to go to RSA. So big thanks for, to Terbium for their sponsorship, not just today, but they are another sponsor who's been around for a very long time as well. So I appreciate their support. So that is that. I've, uh, I've now actually not got commitments. Actually, I do have a media thing this morning. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it could be very awesome or it could turn out to be a lot less awesome. But it's related to car hacking and some of the things that, that I've been up to over the years as well. So we'll see how that works out. I might be able to share that next week. Thank you very much for watching. I will come to you again from home next week. See you guys.